Well, today as we dig in, our topic is why I believe in the Son of God. And I think that's a good topic because most of us or many of us have grown up in church circles and we've grown up around teachings about Jesus and we can talk about, you know, his miracles and we can talk about his works and we can speak of his words and, and all those kinds of things. But, you know, what are the other evidences that give us opportunity to say this is why I believe? Because, you know, we live in a world that's very skeptical. A world in which many people uh, are not going to believe anything, are not going to trust anything. And I'm concerned about that world. Last night as I uh, began to wrap up and the office and prepare to go home. I took one glimpse, you know, through the newspaper online, and, and I saw about the tragedy that happened yesterday on Highway 20, just outside of Bruce. A car load, SUV load of spring breakers from Ohio were on their way back home, veered off the road, overcorrected, ended up in the other lane, running into a SUV load of spring breakers on their way here from Oklahoma. The driver and her passenger on their way to Ohio were killed in the accident. Six other kids are in serious and critical condition. And only one had minor injuries. I can't imagine what it would be like to be the parent on the other end of the phone line to get that kind of a phone call. Nor do I really want to imagine that. It's a pain that I would never wish on anyone. But I was thinking about that. One group had been down here for their break and had had tremendous fun perhaps and gotten a little sun and laughter and relaxation. The other group was here to find that in the midst of a school semester. Neither group had planned on getting into an accident. And certainly those two girls had not planned on dying. I thought about the fact that here we are, a church that's so closely located to where all these people come. I thought about on the other end of our stretch of 98 is another church that is closely located. And I thought about all the people in between. I thought about how I meet many of you up and down the road as we're out exercising in the morning on this stretch. And I thought about, you know, the impacts that were made and, and, and just miles away from where this accident happened, mission team from our church was working yesterday at that time when the fire trucks and the ambulances went past. Did these young people know Jesus Christ? Did they have a relationship with him? Had they come to that knowledge and experience of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God? And if so, who told them? And if not, why didn't we? How do we make that kind of an impact? Well, when you study early church history, this is what you discover. You discover that there was a church that was set on fire for Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, we read that the Spirit descended upon them as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as flames of fire, as, as, uh, as tongues of fire, and, and as a mighty whirling wind. And that church believed upon Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, our ancient uh, documents show us that the church had a three-word confession about Jesus. Jesus Christ, Lord. Jesus Christ, Lord. And so the entire subject of Christianity cannot be approached apart from believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. As the Son of God. And so his person, his claims, his works are central to all of biblical literature and to all of theology and to all of our Christian experience. And so when I think about the tragedies that happen in life, and certainly there are more tragedies than I just, uh, just described, one of the questions I, I want us to be able to answer as a people of God 
And it's a question I want you to be able to answer as you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Is the answer to this, why I believe in the Son of God. And, and this morning I'm going to approach this as we did, why I believe the Bible, why I believe in God. I'm going to take it um, today, though, from a historical approach. And one of the very first reasons that I can believe in the Son of God is because of the fact that He appeared in history. He appeared in history. Now, there's an amazing text that comes to us that the Apostle Paul wrote to his young son in the faith, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. He said, By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up to glory. In these words, the Apostle Paul speaks of the glorious one called Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. He tells us he was revealed, he was vindicated, he was seen, he was proclaimed, he was believed, and now he is in glory. And when we talk about the historical uh, appearance in history, we can take it from two approaches. We can take it from a secular approach, and we can take it from a scriptural approach. From the secular testimony, this is what we gain. There was a historian uh, who was a, a Roman who lived uh, from AD 55 to AD 120. His name was Cornelius Tacitus, and he wrote of Jesus Christ. There was a Greek satirist who ridiculed those who would believe, who lived uh, among the Greeks. His name was Lucian of Samosta. And this is what he wrote concerning the evidence of Christ. The Christians, you know, you're going to say duh at the end of this, I promise. The Christians, you know, they worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. You see, these misguided creatures start with a general conviction that they are immortal for all time, explaining their contempt for death and their voluntary self-devotion. Duh, that's exactly right. But on the flip side of that, we have a non-believing Greek who writes about this. In the Babylonian Talmud, it says on the eve of the Passover, they handed that they hang Yeshua. In other words, the name for Jesus. Josephus, the Jewish historian, the Jewish aristocrat, the Jewish religious man, he wrote these words in the testimonium. Oh, I have a hard time getting this one out. I didn't take Latin. Flavianum. You know the big word. But this is what he wrote. This is what is significant. It's been translated into English. I can read English sometimes. Now, there's about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. This is, this is Josephus. Josephus is a Hebrew. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was, and then it's in brackets, the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him and the tribe of Christians so named for him, are not ex extinct at this day. And so we have a secular historical evidence for Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. But there's also what we call scriptural testimony. And there's a lot of things in the New Testament to satisfy even the, the keenest uh, of modern critics on, uh, on the ancients. But today I want us to look at two verses in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 15, in verses 3 and 4. This is the Apostle Paul, and he sums up the appearance of Jesus Christ in history. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance 
what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And so the apostle sums this up, and he lays his, he lays his, his foundation. Remember why I believe the Bible? The foundation of the word of God, that the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was delivered uh, and he died according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he was raised, not on the fourth day, and not on the first day, but on the third day, just as the scriptures had proclaimed. And so in this one, this one statement, Paul uh, presupposes, and he includes the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, from the secular and then the, uh, the scriptural testimony, there's enough evidence to lead us to believe in the fact of the incarnation, which is the very foundation of our Christianity, and to the fact of the resurrection, which is the completion of that incarnation. And so we have in the appearing in history, you know, an indisputable fact that requires some form of belief that certainly Jesus came. Now, what are the four resulting historical events, though? Don't put it up yet. Who can guess? Any resulting historical events? It's going to put you to the test. AC to, or a, BC to AD, that's, that's a good one. But how about this? A resulting historical event. The Church of Jesus Christ. Remember what... Um, Lucian of Samosta said, these people are still meeting, and they still have this belief that death's not going to touch them. And remember what Josephus said, these, this Christian tribe is still gathering? The church of Jesus Christ has been here for two millennia. We meet in rooms like this. We meet in little huts in the jungle. I've met with uh, churches in, in little tiny brick buildings along Benjo ditches in Indonesia. I've met with the Church of Jesus Christ in the jungles of New Guinea and in the mountains of North Africa and in the plains of southern Ukraine and in the, 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 the wealth and the beauty and the majesty of buildings in, in the London. But the Church of Jesus Christ is still here. A second thing, the Christian ordinances. When we talk about baptism, it's still here. We, the church, still practice baptism. That when a person comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that he takes that step and goes into those waters and, and is buried in Christ and he's raised in his likeness. And we celebrate communion. We come and we break the bread and we drink of the cup. We're doing that next Sunday as the choir uh, brings to us a, a musical rendition and as we have a silent message that's all around the cross and the Lord's table. And we take of that. And in doing that, we proclaim his death until he comes. And then a third thing. A third thing is this. It's simple. Anybody want to take a jab at it? Sunday. The Christian Sunday. Up until this time, the Hebrews gathered on the Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week. It is Saturday. And it's not the same. So Sunday's the very first of the day of the week. On Sunday, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's why I'm so excited when I tweet out, Sunday is coming. We come together to celebrate every Sunday that we serve a resurrected Lord. He's not dead and in the grave. He's risen just as he said. And then the fourth uh, historical event is what we call the Christian Easter. I really like to call it Resurrection Day. But uh, it's what we call the Christian Easter. And, and, and it's celebrated every year. It's kept on all five continents. It can be associated with the same historical uh, time and circumstances. We remember on Friday that Jesus died. And we celebrate on Sunday that Jesus rose just as he said, Ralph Waldo Emerson, what a name. Remember reading Ralph Waldo Emerson in school? He said this, the name of Jesus is not so much written as it is plowed into the history of the world. 
And men never tire from reading about him. So that's his appearance in history. Now think about this. Jesus Christ stood alone in history. Jesus Christ stood alone in history. Because when we talk about that, you know, he's beyond all reasonable question, the greatest man who ever lived. He was the greatest man who ever lived. You know, Jesus is not just one of the world's great ones. You know, we had Alexander the Great, and we had Charles the Great, and we had Napoleon the Little Great. Those of you didn't catch that, I'll get it by snail mail tomorrow. You know, we can talk about these guys, but Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. He's not just Jesus the Great. I want you to grab a hold of this. This is the most important statement I'll make today. He is Jesus the only. He's the only. He stands alone in history. He stands out alone from all other men. He stands unique by comparison, yet he was a real man. Today, if the President of the United States were to come walking into this room, we would all stand out of respect for that office. But if Jesus, the only, came walking down this aisle, we would bow on our faces before him, and we would give him our worship, and we would give him our praise, and we would express to him our love. He was a real man, yet he's the only. As a real man, he's absolute deity. As you encounter Jesus Christ in the words of the New Testament, you're impressed by his deity in the very words that he spoke. Three times in the Gospel of John, he claimed that he existed before creation. In John 8, 58, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born... Now, have you ever wondered why I didn't say I was instead of I am? Before Abraham was born, I am. Why did he say that? Jesus is, is incredibly, you know, related to the Father. And what he's speaking, he's speaking among people who knew what had happened as Moses would lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. When Moses asked God, who shall I say has sent me? And God responds and says to him, I am that I am has sent you. In other words, he was telling Moses and Moses was telling the people that I am all that you could ever want. I'm all that you could ever need. I am your only way of salvation. I am your only way of satisfaction. When the Lord Jesus Christ speaks this, he's speaking those very same words. In that great high priestly prayer where he prayed for we, the church, to be one, to stand together in unity, the Lord Jesus said, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. Now some would say, well... Okay, he was with, Christ, with the Father before the world was, but, but maybe the Father created him before he created the world, before he separated the, the, the light from the darkness, and before he put birds in the air and fish in the sea and man on the, on the planet. But Jesus claims co-eternity with the Father. He says, I and the Father are one. So we see it in his words. We see, it, uh, we see that he was a real man in respect to his absolute deity in his works. And when I'm speaking of the works of the master, you know, I don't want to talk particularly about the miracles that he performed in the days of his flesh because similar miracles were done by the Old Testament saints and by New Testament apostles. But I want to speak about the works of particular of creation and the works of preservation and the works of redemption. In John 1, 3, the Bible tells us that all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In the book of the Colossians, the apostle Paul writes these amazing words and says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth both visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before thing, all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, I wish I thought of this illustration earlier. I, it hit me as I was reading that verse again in the first service, but there's a pastor preacher by the name of Louis Giglio who does such an awesome job with this. He talks about a protein called laminin. Laminin is a protein that is in all, uh, all living creatures, and it's the protein that holds us together. 
Now, let me remind you, the latter part of that verse says that in him all things hold together. But what about laminin? Well, when you take laminin underneath the, the microscope, you know what shape laminin is found? It's found in the cross. You've heard me say this before. I think it's such a, an awesome, awesome analogy. It's found in the shape of the cross. Jesus Christ holds all things together. He did it on the cross. He did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for us. He, he came that he might put our lives together. He came that he might make us whole. He came that he might make us solid. He came that he might fill us up. He came that he might give us hope. He came that he might give us a future. Jesus Christ appeared in, in, in history, and he appeared as the one and only. He appeared as absolute deity. The book of Hebrews tells us, and he was the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. We see it in his works. We see it in his worship. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, any time on earth that anybody came along that wanted to bow before him and worship him, he, turned the, he never turned them away. The disciples did. Remember old Peter? Peter, you know, is preaching the gospel in the book of Acts. He's performing a few miracle things along the way, and, and he touches somebody, and they want to bow down and worship him. And he says, stand up. I'm just a man too. But Jesus Christ never did that. When the woman came and worshiped him, she came and she bowed down before him and she said, Lord, help me. And Jesus said, oh woman, your faith is great. Thomas, you know, Thomas was one of the disciples and Thomas had the very same uh, issue that you and I sometimes have. He doubted. Have you ever doubted your faith? I have. I've struggled with faith at times. And so Thomas is doubting. Christ has been crucified. He's not met the risen Lord yet. But when he sees his hands and his feet, and he sees that brow upon which that crown of thorns had sat, he bows before him and he says, My Lord and my God. We later read that the 11 disciples, they went on to Galilee to a mountain where the Lord Jesus Christ had designated them to go. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 28 that when they saw him, they worshipped him. When they saw him, they worshipped him. And God said in Hebrews 1, 6, and let all the angels of God worship him. So we see it in his worship. And Paul sums up that absolute deity of the Son of God in one of the most profound statements in the entirety of the, of the Bible. In the book of Colossians chapter 2, verse number 9, for in him the fullness, for in him the fullness, that means not one little bit is left out. In him, the fullness of the Godhead dwells. He was a real man in absolute purity. The greatness of a man is, is, is estimated by two things. The, the dignity of his character and the, the extent of his influence. You know, Jesus could face his friends. He could face his foes. And, and, and he could ask, which one of you convicts me of sin? As a matter of fact, old Pilate, when he stood before him, Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. Christ's character is centered in sinlessness. The apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In 1 John, John writes and says, In him there's no sin. Peter says, He who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Sinlessness was the holiness and the goodness of his life that impacted people during his earthly ministry and continues on to this day. Socrates... Socrates taught for 40 years. Plato taught for 50 years. And Aristotle taught for 40 years. Jesus' public life and ministry and teaching was three years. Yet the influence of those three years 
infinitely transcends the impact of the combined 130 years of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Jesus painted no pictures, yet some of the very finest paintings of Raphael and Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci are inspired by the Christ. He wrote no poetry, but Dante and Milton and many other of the world's greatest poets were inspired by him. He composed no music. Still Hayden and Handel and Beethoven, Beethoven, Bach, Mendelssohn, and Plunk have reached their highest perfection in him, in the perfection of their melodies, in their hymns, and in their symphonies, and in their oratories. He was a real man in absolute, in absolute sovereignty. He said in John 10, 17, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Nobody else has been able to say that. There's nobody in the room that says, I have the authority to lay my life down. And I also have the authority, after I've laid it down, to be in the grave to say, get up. Now, you might try to say, get up, but you're not going to have any giddy up and you're up. It's not going to work that way. Jesus Christ has that absolute sovereignty, that absolute authority to do just that. Jesus Christ was either the world's greatest imposter, the world's greatest fraud, the world's greatest liar, the, great, the, the world's worst lunatic, or he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, just as he said. It's an evidence that demands a verdict. Josh McDowell wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. There's a, a new edition out, More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. You, you know, you've got to make a decision. And every time that we come together and that Christ is presented, you are making a decision. Either he's real or he's not. You say, well, pastor, I'm not saying he's not. I'm just putting him off. Well, you're saying he's not real then because you're saying he's not real enough, he's not factual enough for me today. Now think about this. The Lord Jesus Christ in the third place had an absolute authority in history as well. Ever since Jesus Christ came into the world, men have never been able to rid themselves of the feeling that in Jesus Christ is the answer to one's faith. Now man has tried to find answer in other forms of, of things, for example, we go to Buddha. But what does Buddha do? We see that little man sitting as a stone statue uh, with his little belly, and you go and rub the belly of Buddha, and you go and rub his belly. Maybe you do it ten times a day, but Buddha never comes through. Or you could be a Hindu and go to all the many gods of the Hindus and hope those gods come through, and, and maybe, you know, you won't come back... Uh, as, a, as at the bottom of the ladder in humanity. Maybe you'll come back and maybe eventually you can be a god. No answer for sin in Buddhism. No answer for sin in Hinduism. Sin's missing the mark. Maybe you practice Islam. You pray five times a day. You face towards Mecca. You go to the Hajj, you give alms to the poor, you say Allah is great, but there's no guarantee of heaven. You can hope real hard, but it's only a hope that doesn't fulfill. You say, well, I'm not going to trust anybody. I've seen that stuff in churches. I've seen that stuff in religion. But you can't even trust yourself. You can't even trust yourself. But when you come to the place when you, where you consider the reality of Jesus Christ, you really have to admit with old Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. This authoritative Son of God has the power to search us. Remember, he and the Father one, Jeremiah 17.10 says this, I 
The Lord searched the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Jesus Christ is a fact of our conscience. We cannot think of him without being examined ourselves, interrogated authoritatively and reviewed uh, to the very innermost part of our minds and our hearts and our wills. You know, I can study old Aristotle, and you know, I can be kind of, I can be kind of intellectually edified. I can talk to Dan Elvers, our youth pastor, and be intellectually and theologically edified. I, I love Dan. I love Matt both. They're great men. I'm glad they're on our staff. I can be edified. But grab a hold of this. When I study Jesus Christ... And when I look into myself, you know, I, I don't find that. I don't find that. I don't find that edification. I don't find that, that building up. The book of the Revelation says that if we, if we search and know him, we'll soon fill his eyes. The Bible says his eyes were like flames of fire. Revelation 1.14. He has the authority to save. Jesus Christ laid out certain uh, claims that nobody else could make. We see that in Capernaum as he healed the paralytic, as he was confronted, as he was condemned for doing so. And he said, what do you think is easier to do? To tell this man to walk or to say your sins are forgiven? And then he says, the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. No one's ever turned in genuine repentance to the Son of God for forgiveness. Now get this. No one's ever turned to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in sincerity for forgiveness and have found him to fail. Kind of reminds me of that old song that used to be kind of a new song. Jesus never fails. Remember that song? Who sings that? Matt. Truth? Okay, it's a truth song. Jesus never fails. No one who's ever turned to Jesus Christ in genuine repentance has found him to fail. How many of you can agree with that? He never fails. He loves you. Now, I fail. You know, I, I mess up. He has the, the ability to satisfy. You know, nature is a beautiful thing to look at, but it can't bring full and lasting satisfaction. History can be disappointing. And when I look into myself, I find contradiction and I find confusion. I can agree with the Apostle Paul. Oh, what a wretched man that I am. The very thing that I ought to do, I, I do not. And the very thing that I ought not to do, that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who can set me free? He asked. And his answer is none other but Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know, I've, I've um, jokingly say every once in a while, you know, that in my spiritual gifts inventory, you know, I rate, you know, a 10 out of 10 in certain spiritual gifts, but the one spiritual gift that everybody gets a chuckle out of is mercy. In the area of mercy, I only rate a two. I am not a merciful pastor. Some people, they just have mercy. They just ooze mercy. They just pour out mercy. But you know, at times, we want to use the evidence that we're not gifted in a particular way as an excuse for behavior. And therefore, when I'm mean and I'm snappy, well, God didn't gift me with mercy. I can be mean and snappy. 
Matter of fact, when I first came to this church, there's a couple of folks here that said they had the gift of prophecy and they didn't have the gift of mercy because prophets aren't merciful. Therefore, they didn't have to be merciful. But let me tell you, when Jesus comes in and he meets us and he saves us and he satisfies us, he calls his mercy, not as a spiritual gift, but he calls his mercy to flow from us as we relate not only with ourselves but as we relate with our spouse, as we relate with our brother, with our sister, with our parents, with our grandparents, with those we work around, with those we go to school with. He causes the goodness of his spirit to ooze through us, and he alone has the ability to bring satisfaction to our soul. The Lord Jesus Christ, he speaks to us, and he says, listen, I know you've got problems. Anybody got a problem? You know, if you've got a problem, raise your hand, hold it up for a minute. Oh, look at there. We all got problems. We all suffer from difficulties. Joe and Kara have a huge problem sitting beside them this morning. Josh turned 16 this week. Yesterday, right? All right. Defensive player of the year for his basketball team. I'll brag on you like your mama does. We got a problem. He's ready for that new car. Amen? Joe, you got to go buy him a new car, buddy. But, you know, we all have a problem to some degree. But listen, we can talk lightly. But we can talk in the very depths of seriousness, seriousness. Seriousness. Because you know what I find? is We all face serious problems at one point or another. And this is what Jesus Christ said. So simple. He said, come to me, you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a tremendous invitation, and that's that invitation today. Why should I believe in Jesus Christ? Look at all that historical evidence. So let me turn the question around to you. Why shouldn't you believe in Jesus Christ? Is there a good reason not to trust him? You know, you can look at others and say, well, I don't want to be like them. God didn't call you to be like them. He called you to be you. He called you to live the plan that he has for you and the purpose he has for you. If you were to tragically die today, can you say, Pastor, I know I'm ready to meet my Lord. Yesterday when those two girls died, I don't know what their condition was. Like I said, we had a mission team that was close. We've got churches in between where everybody's hanging out. I was in Fort Walton performing a funeral. But the question comes back to you all these possibilities for encounter, have you encountered Jesus? Did you accept his invitation to come to him? And did you accept his promise for rest? Let's pray. Father, to you be the glory, to you be the honor, to you be the praise. In these moments that lie before us, Father, I just ask you to pour your spirit out in these moments in power and in might and that you would draw men and women, boys and girls to Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, our praise team is going to begin to sing and I just want you to sit there and talk to God in this very first verse of the song they're singing. Straight so far away, we cut 
down people in your name, but the sword was never ours to swing. Jesus, friend of sinners, the truth becomes so hard to see. The world is on their way to you, but they're tripping over me. Always looking around, but never looking up, I'm so double-minded. Blank eyed saint with dirty hands and a heart divided. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us read. Sinners, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Would you come as the Lord has spoken to you? He's your friend and he loves you. Jesus, friend of sinners, the one who's riding in the sand, may the righteous turn away. And the stones fall from their hands. Help us to remember we are all the least of these. Let the memory of your mercy bring your people to their knees. We don't want to roar, only what we're against when we judge the wounded. What if we put down our signs, crossed over the lines, and love like you did? Oh, Jesus, you're the friend of sinners. Open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us Open hearts and open doors. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, break our hearts for what breaks yours. You love every lost cause. You reach for the outcast, for the leper and the lame. There's a reason that you came. I was that lost cause, and I was his outcast. But you died for sinners just like me, a grateful leper at your feet. Cause you are good, you are good, and your love endures forever. Cause you are good, you are good, and your love endures forever. Cause you are good, you are good, and your love endures forever.
Is that not a touching song? I mean, it just really gets us. I'm going to hang out here at the front for a few minutes as we dismiss. And if you were afraid to step out in front of people, that's okay. Listen, I understand. But you've got a decision you want to make for Christ. You feel that draw. Come on, talk to me, okay? Sign up for the Resurrection Run. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we have a special called business meeting. We only meet once a year for business. But uh, tonight, we've got to wrap up the uh, proposal and get the church to sign off on the sale of the property across the street. There were some things that happened between the initial contract and it running out and redoing and all that kind of stuff. And so the, um, the finance uh, stewardship team along with the, um, the church elders are ready to bring that to you uh, and it's backed by the deacons. And so it's going to be a good thing and uh, we'll get it done and God's blessing us. They'll explain all that to you a little bit later. Uh, good to see Herschel and his wife with us today. Herschel's our retired director of I don't know whether to call you retiring or retire retiring but he's about to be retired and uh, looking for he's looking forward to that God bless you have a glorious day and keep looking up